in Ecuador and Bolivia, what we had is in 2008 to 2009, the approval in the constitution, the new constitution in which the rights of nature are part of the, of the constitution. What both constitutions grant is the rights of nature, so um, two things, one rights of nature and the other the rights of el buen vivir, of the good life. But suddenly what you see in Yasuni is that actually through biodiversity suddenly you start seeing to, in, to a certain extent, and particularly in their documents, that the indigenous starts becoming a, classified as something that needs to be protected as such. Indigenous slowly start to be framed as, na as part of nature. What first is a struggle for the rights of nature, and the rights of nature, it's not the rights of a Western conception of nature, it's a right to a different conception of nature. Pachamam is something very specific in some specific place that, that, and that, that has, doesn't have to do anything with, for example, an Inuit. The conflict in the Andes uh, between Quechua people and people from the rainforest is precisely because of that. I mean, the concept of Pachamama. Pachamama is agriculture and people in the rainforest. They are not agriculture based, so there has been this problem that people from the mountains come in to the, to the rainforest because they want to, and, and burning down the, 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 the forest. If you use Pachamama, that erases a lot of differences, as you just said. And you, but, and you take it for granted, and you believe in that definition as a kind of a definition that you live for, you're lost. But if you think not about where does Pachamama come, who owns it, what can you do with it? From a pragmatic situation in which you have a relation of forces, in this context, what is this guy mobilizing? And they mobilize Pachamama in the same day that they're going to say we have nothing to do with Pachamama. If it's not convenient. And the whole point of this is not to say that Pachamam is better than biodiversity, better than oil blocks, better than this and that. I was just thinking, like, what if these indigenous people decide to extract the oil? That's what's happening in Australia. The green movement is in a quandary. Because um, being historical supporters of indigenous rights in Australia, uh, now um, indigenous groups in Australia are uh, uh, looking for mining rights and making lots of money out of it. Now what you notice is that, and this is an indigenous community, is the Ogoni, yeah, which were never properly accounted in the large scale of what is Nigerian politics. Um, the Ogoni are no longer saying that they get rid of oil. No, they're speaking about proper oil installations, autonomy. Uh, they're speaking about having some access to the profit that is made, because if you're destroying the land, at least you want a proper redistribution of the profits that are made through that. So it doesn't mean that in the beginning of, of the Ogoni movement they're fighting against oil and they're fighting to expel shell oil and they managed to expel shell oil out of a certain area. But after a while in which the whole economy that surrounds them is only an oil economy, they don't simply go and say get rid of oil out of here because there's not much more that you can do. The fisheries are destroyed, the mangroves are destroyed. Part of my research has been following the intergovernmental platform on biodiversity and ecosystem services, which is kind of trying to do for ecosystem services what the IPCC has done for climate change in terms of assessing and sort of um, coordinating global knowledge. And Bolivia has been a really active force in that process, um, trying to continually sort of disrupt the concept of ecosystem services as you know, a kind of neoliberal capitalist, green capitalist um, kind of idea. The authors of this document kept using this metaphor of the Rosetta Stone that was translating between these different value systems. And um, a lot of the controversy was precisely that that translation was impossible. These indigenous communities seem to be able to use Pachamama and in connection to biodiversity if it is a benefit to them. So what does that mean in terms of those who made it? Like, what is sort of... What's sort of left from the Western epistemology in science or technology? There are examples of, of satellites being used in, in Aborigine communities to um, literally make their <coughs> culture global. They have used uh, a channel called, I think it's Imparia, which is uh, um, the word for tracks, which is quite good uh, analogy to the satellites orbiting, uh, because they're tracks actually around Earth. So it's a culture walking over space. If you look at the, at the normal picture, the trees are the same. But you look at the multi-spec uh, image and you do an analysis and what you have is a decrease of health in those, in those trees and in the whole surrounding vegetation. I trust much more the, the farmer to tell me that than I trust the satellite image. However, uh, when we present these documents, the copper corporation called Elco from Chile, well, they were much more concerned with the satellite image than they were with the farmers. But the shift is when then you allow it to convert into kind of a broader 
conceptual political spectrum in which a yes, satellite becomes, for instance, just to extrapolate on that example, the predominant uh, way through which law looks at indigenous territoriality. That dimension of image making and activism need to be understood. In the first place, there is something that is particular about science, that it is the best thing to mobilize against scientific statements, is another one. Um, and those, the, the kind of the, the, the problem of colonial science and... You know, sort of science that might be mobilized by human rights groups or by environmental groups, etc., is exactly needing to enter into the ability of images to both build and destroy.